Hello to the best religion to 11 students I have ever had in my entire life in the spring of 2020. You are incredible. Uh, we are back at it this week. Hopefully you are excited and happy. Hopefully good things have happened to you. Um, let's see. I don't think I have any announcements. Uh, there's a test that ends on Tuesday the 19th, so make sure that that test is uh, taken care of. If you have any troubles with it, make sure you text Danica and let her know. Um, and I think that's about it. Uh, hopefully you're getting all your work done. If you're struggling in any way, please let me know. Uh, I want to help you. Um, yeah, if you just want to chat, let me know. Shoot me an email and just say, Brother Smith, I, you know, there were office hours. I'd come in to chat with you. So let's make some office hours. Let's have a Zoom office hours or something. I want to make sure that I'm available. Uh, for you whenever you need. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, anything at all. Um, and uh, I'm like you. I'm waiting to see if we're going to be back in the fall. I really, really hope we are. Um, I'm really hoping we are back in the fall. But if we're not, we'll make it work, right? We'll make it work. Okay, so today we are going to be in the Gospel of Luke. We're going to do some reviewing for our next exam. This would be lecture seven, right? Okay, so we're going to do some reviewing for our next exam, and uh, we um, are going to get into some uh, new material. We should get through Luke 15. You've done your reading already. You've done your journaling already, so your mind is all set to uh, learn some more and just maybe go to a higher level of understanding of this incredible uh, this incredible book. Okay, so let's review uh, everything for the second exam. So I might ask you uh, on the second exam, uh, who's the only gospel author to give us the parable of the laborers in the vineyard? You'll say Matthew and you'll be right because this is the last thing we covered before we got into Luke. Uh, we said that the, he hires his laborers from this temp, temp office, right, uh, beginning at 6 a.m. and then 9 a.m. and then noon and then 3 p.m. and then lastly at 5 p.m. We talked about who would be there, right, from the, to the very end. Uh, and uh, we talked about how he switched the order of when he'd pay them. He was going to pay them in the order that uh, they, didn't, they got paid in reverse order, right, from when they got there. And uh, we talked about comparison. Maybe we didn't. Did I miss that? I'm certain I think we didn't talk about that. We should have if we didn't, because that's really what the parable is about, right? Uh, we said the uh, when the workers were mad about, you know, that the boss gave them, that he made the 11th hour workers, that he gave them the same wage, he said, uh, Why, I can do this. I fulfilled my agreement to you, and I can do what I want with my own money, right? And that Elder Holland quote, that's what JRH is right there. Why are you jealous? Because I am kind. Uh, and hopefully, I, maybe we didn't use the word comparison, but hopefully you thought about it, right? That these guys would have been fine with their wages had they not compared themselves to other people. Comparison is such a dangerous, dangerous game. And really, in comparison, you really can't win, right? I mean, think about in comparison. If you think you're better than someone in comparison, you come out arrogant, prideful. If you think you're worse off than someone, you come out angry, right? Or frustrated or disappointed or discouraged. So really, when it comes to comparison, there is no winning to be done. Now, oftentimes we have to use benchmarks to find out if we're, if we're doing well, but we could use ourself. We can use the standard in the scriptures. We can use uh, all you know, general conference talks to see how we're doing. We don't need to compare ourselves to other people. So, uh, you know, I, I think um, it was my mother-in-law who had a, um, on her bathroom mirror or bathroom, there was a little plaque that said, comparison is the thief of joy. And it really is, right? These guys would have been very joyful with their money had they not compared. And, and we often do that. Uh, people do that in marriage, right? They're like, I, I'd be very happy with my marriage if I wasn't comparing, you know, myself to someone else's Instagram marriage. It's easy to be happy and perfect on Instagram, by the way. Um, uh, we do this with uh, families. We do this with houses. We do this with clothes, right? We would be very happy with what we have had we not compared it to somebody else. So, um, let's make sure that the parable of the labors in the vineyard really sticks to us and says, okay, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to really try to catch myself in comparison and stop, uh, and say, no, I, you know, I'm not going to do that. Okay. 
Um, so I'll, I might ask you, you know, about Elder Holland's quote. I might ask you about the order they got paid in, stuff like that. That'll be on the exam. The more important thing is that you overcome comparison, right? That's more important to me. Uh, but I can't really put that on the exam, right? Have you overcome comparison? I haven't. You fail, right? I, I can't do that. But I might ask you, which parable did we talk about comparison? Uh, that would be an exam question. Okay, uh, then we moved into the Gospel of Luke, and we said that the Gospel of Luke is definitely more polished than the other Gospels, more like a, you know, a work of literature, published literature that you would have. Um, definitely more stories involving women. That's an easy exam question, right? Which one of our Gospel authors writes more about women than the others? Uh, and it makes sense. He's a Gentile. He's a Gentile author writing to a Gentile audience. How do we know that? Well, he never really gets into any of the Judaism in, Judas, in Jesus's life. Uh, you would think that he either uh, get, you know, doesn't include it on purpose because he's writing for Gentiles, or he's a Gentile and he just doesn't understand it or know it, so he just skips it entirely. Um, who is our gospel author that also wrote the book of Acts? You'll say Luke. You'll get that question right. Good job. Um, and we talked about how he is known as the first Christian historian because he never met Jesus personally, or at least there's no evidence that he met Jesus personally. I'll show you one place in his gospel where people think he shows up. The same with Mark. Mark has one part in his gospel where people think the actual Mark shows up. Um, but the tradition is that he interviews Mary and gets the beginning chapters that we talked about. Uh, and that's where it starts in Luke 1, 2, and 3. Um, so you have, um, uh, I might ask you, you know, <clears throat> who's the only gospel author to give us the story of Elizabeth and Zacharias? That's an important thing. Like if I were talking to someone about the four gospels and they claim to have taken a class on the four gospels and they didn't know that Elizabeth and Zacharias uh, only come into uh, the account of Luke, I'd be like, yeah, I don't think you learned much. Now, some people might be like, well, Brother Smith, that's trivia. I, I don't know. I, is it trivia? Um, to someone who really claims to, un, you know, to uh, understand the Bible, I, I don't know if it's trivia. Uh, I think it's just a basic understanding of, uh, you know, you might be like, well, that's not going to have influence on my exaltation. It's probably not, but, uh, well, it's absolutely not, but I, you know, this class just isn't about, okay, what are we going to do to get exaltation? It's about understanding the scriptures, both, both exegetically and eisegetically. So um, I, I, hopefully you're, you're, you're grasping that and you're not uh, feeling like, oh, he just he tests us on trivia. It's not. It's, you know, understanding the storyline, understanding the basics of the Gospels, their history. Um, now, I'm, I don't know why I'm talking about this. Okay, because most of you are probably okay with what we're doing. All right, uh, so we have Gabriel, who Joseph Smith identifies as Noah, appearing to Zacharias in the temple, and then Zacharias doubts the promise of the son being, uh, come, the son being born, and um, we talked a little bit about why do we pray for things that we don't really believe will happen, um, right? Uh, we can learn a little bit from Zacharias there. Great guy, by the way, Zacharias, not a bad guy, great guy. Uh, Gabriel visits Mary, great girl, amazing girl, and says, Blessed art thou among women. We talked about her being foreordained in the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon adds this foreordination of this, um, this incredible woman. Uh, so I might ask you about that on the exam. Um, uh, we talked a little bit about Elizabeth being so validating to Mary, right? Whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Uh, hopefully you're a very validating person. Uh, I probably won't ask you how validating you are on the exam, but I might ask you, uh, who was it that said to Mary, when says this to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? And hopefully when you get that question right, you say, well, that was Elizabeth. You think to yourself, I need to be more validating uh, to other people and to myself. Okay. Um, we talked about Mary quoting Hannah's song and how this could be an indication that she knows the scriptures really well uh, and that she's literate, uh, which would have been somewhat rare for uh, young women in her situation. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, we talked about the baby blessing that is Elizabeth interrupted the naming. And when Zacharias could speak, he gave a beautiful baby blessing. Uh, thou child shall be called the prophet of the highest. The sunrise from on high hath visited us to give light to them that sit in darkness in the shadow of death. Uh, and if you didn't cry during that baby blessing, you, um, you need to see your bishop. Okay, uh, so that's review slide number one. So this is going to be all, all of these uh, bullet points could definitely be questions on the exam. And uh, if you've already taken our first exam, you probably have figured that out, that most of the bullet points become questions. 
Okay, uh, let's go to the second review slide, uh, Luke 2 through Luke 7, and then we'll pick up uh, where we left off. So we talked about the Roman census uh, being probably why Joseph goes to Bethlehem. It's about, it's either 60 miles if you go through Samaria, 90 miles if you go around. Uh, and then we asked, why does Mary go to Bethlehem? Uh, and a lot of us might think, well, she wants to be with her, uh, you know, her fiance. That's probably not the case. Um, this, these are arranged marriages, right? Now, hopefully they have a, a, a friendship, uh, but, uh, they, and they wouldn't go by themselves. Kind of in our head, we've got Joseph and Mary, right? And Mary's on the donkey. There's no donkey in this government. Uh, but um, that, that they wouldn't have been traveling alone. Um, we talked about maybe Mary goes to Bethlehem because she knows her scriptures, Micah chapter five, uh, about the savior, the Messiah being born in Bethlehem. Um, we talked about no room for them in the inn. Were they poor? Those are plenty of indications that they're poor. They use a manger. They use, uh, they have the sacrifice of the turtle doves at the temple. So there's plenty of indications that they're a poor couple. Why was there no room for them in the inn? Um, I don't know. I don't know, maybe, right? We talked about perhaps she's pregnant. Well, she is pregnant. Perhaps it's because she's pregnant uh, that there's no room for her in the inn. Uh, either way, it seems that they this takes place in a cave, not a stable. There's no stable there. Uh, it's been a cave. Um, and we talked about after the Savior is born that they go to the temple and both Simeon and Anna meet them there. Uh, so any of those could be questions on an exam. I might ask you, you know, how far is it between Nazareth and Bethlehem? I might ask you, um, what indications are there that Joseph and Mary are poor? Or what, uh, what do we say could be a possibility of why Mary goes to Bethlehem? Um, I might ask you, who's the only gospel author to tell us the story of, uh, you know, Simeon and Anna in the temple? Stuff like that. Okay. Uh, Luke 3, we kind of skimmed through that. Uh, it's just the idea of another lineage. Um, most likely, most New Testament scholars think it's a Leverite versus a biological marriage. If you uh, don't remember that, go back and check the uh, YouTube video on that. Um, and the, the, the reason the two lineages are different is because their purposes are different, right? I could write your lineage really differently, couldn't I? Uh, so I get a couple of generations back. Um, there's a lot of directions you can go through families. Um, and if I want to connect you to certain people uh, because of the person I'm writing to, right, that's going to make a, that's going to make a difference on where I go through your genealogy. Okay. Uh, Luke four is the story of the synagogue in Nazareth. Again, easy exam questions for me are like, who's the only gospel author to tell us that story? Um, uh, I might ask you where the Savior was raised. What city was the Savior raised in? According to Luke, it's where? Nazareth. Nazareth's not a big place, by the way. Uh, remember, up in Galilee, in the northern area, why am I looking at the microphone like you're the student? Uh, up in Galilee, in the northern area, um, these are a lot of tiny towns. The biggest ones are like Capernaum, uh, Magdala, because they're close to the Sea of Galilee. As you get further from the Sea of Galilee, obviously, people are going to become more sparse. The towns are going to become more sparse. So when you're talking Nazareth, you're talking a village of, I don't know, uh, 50 families, right? Just not a lot of people there. Uh, so if you, any of you grew up in a small town, you know you know what that's like, right? That everybody knows everybody else's business. It's kind of nice because pretty much everyone in town is related and uh, there's a big community feeling, right? Uh, but there's also a lot of gossip um, and everybody, you know, there's not a lot to do. So we talk about each other. So uh, I might ask you when the savior goes back home to Nazareth, what does he read to the group there, right? And if you're asking the savior to read any scripture, he's probably, if he has to choose, he's going to choose what? Isaiah. He chooses Isaiah 61 uh, about the Messiah and then says today that scripture is fulfilled in your ears. And then he tells them, but you're not going to accept me here. No prophet is accepted in his own country. You're not going to accept me. And he tells them two Old Testament stories. Could you tell me what they are? Don't look. Tell me what they are. Look right in the camera. Look right at your screen. Do not look at the slide and tell me what they are. Uh-huh. Good. Good. Nope, that's wrong. Just kidding. I don't know what you said. But the two stories you should have told me are one uh, about Elijah and the widow of Zarephath. And it's a story of a Israelite prophet who was accepted by a Gentile woman after he had been 
rejected by his own people. And the other story should be Elisha and Naaman, which is a very similar story about a Gentile man who accepts a prophet, an Israelite prophet, uh, after he'd been rejected by Israel, which makes this town, these two stories make the town in his town's people, his town's people, his neighbors, um, very upset, and they try to kill him, and he never returns to Nazareth. So all of these might be questions on exam two. What Old Testament stories does the Savior tell um, to his hometown in Nazareth? Uh, I might ask you why the people in Nazareth were so upset with him after the day in the synagogue. I might ask you, um, according to the Bible dictionary, the Savior never returns to what city um, ever again? You'll say Nazareth. Um, from now on, he's going to say, uh, I think I told you this on the last exam, he's going to say, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the son of man, that's him, has nowhere to lay his head. All right, he can't go home. So uh, then we got to the calling of the apostles in Luke 5. Uh, we talked about how you know, you, how you can read scripture a little differently. Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And we talked about how, you know, Depends on how you read that and project onto it, you know, what attitude Peter's taking there. He says, fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men, and they forsook all and followed him. All right. Um, this is not the first time they've met. Definitely not the first time they've met. Um, it's very likely that all the apostles are followers of John. Um, in fact, Peter says, Luke says so in uh, the, the Gospel of Acts, or he writes that Peter said so in the Gospel of Acts. And um, I think that's about it for that. And we finished, I think we finished with Luke 7, uh, Simon the Pharisee. So this isn't Simon Peter. This is Simon the Pharisee who invites the Savior over for dinner, but doesn't treat him very well. Um, she brings in this alabaster, this woman brings in an alabaster box of ointment. We talked, talk, this is super expensive. This is like a year's worth of, um, of oil, right? And... Uh, and as she starts to anoint the Savior, the, uh, the Pharisee Simon says, I wouldn't let that woman touch me. She's a sinner. And the Savior says, can I tell you a quick story? And this is called an uh, a entrapment parable. We're going to look at more that the Savior tells. Uh, but he says there was uh, once a man who owed, had two people owe him money, one 500, the other 50, he forgave them both who will love him more. And Simon says, put your right hand in. Just kidding. Simon responds. Um, I guess the him who he forgave more. And he says, you are right. Um, do you see this woman? And we talked about, do you see this woman? I love that phrase. Because uh, I don't think Simon sees her, right? He sees a sinner, but he doesn't see her. Um, and uh, we talked about what perhaps the 550 mean. It can't be an amount of sin, right? It can't be like, well, I need to sin more so I can be forgiven of more. Uh, I think it might be repentance. It might be how much sin you recognize in yourself, right? You recognize that you're a 500 pence sinner and not a 50 pence sinner when maybe for a while you're like, I'm a 50 pence sinner. No big deal. No, you're a 500 pence sinner. We all are. And uh, when we've realized that and we know that the Savior has forgiven our sins, we obviously love him even more. Um, and then Neil L. Anderson, that's that NLA, said, uh, we must become converted to daily repentance. So that's our ac application part of that. I probably won't ask you on an exam. Have you become converted to daily repentance? No. Uh, hey, it kind of sounds like the penguin on um, Madagascar. Have you become converted to daily repentance? Corporal. Oh, sorry. Uh, okay. So that, um, that wraps that up. So, uh, oh, I was going to tell you a quick story with this that I didn't tell you last time. I'm going to set my Bible behind me here. Um, this might be a good place to tell this. I can't remember if I, if I would tell it another area, but this will work. So some, some of us are sitting here going, but Brother Smith, I just don't have a lot to repent of. Like I'm doing really well. I just got home with my mission. I read scripture every day. I pray. Uh, I can't go into the temple, so I go sit outside the temple daily for nine hours, right? You just might be thinking you're doing really well, and that's okay. It's not bad to think you're doing really well, right? It's, you don't have to, you know, uh, you don't have to feel like you're the worst sinner in the world every single day, but I did want to share a story with you to kind of help you see maybe where you could improve um, and where I could improve, of course, because uh, you guys are way better than me, and you are. You think I'm saying that, like, no, you are way better than me, and uh, you inspire me. 
But this story always makes me think, man, I got to do better. So a uh, true story of Howard W. Hunter. He had a good friend named John Huntsman Sr. You've probably heard of the Huntsman family. John Huntsman Sr. was a self-made billionaire uh, in Utah. Uh, they both have passed away since, but uh, they were very good friends. I guess they served in stake presidencies or served as stake presidents, I'm not sure, together uh, in Southern California. Well, when Howard W. Hunter becomes president of the church, he still stays close to his friend, John Huntsman. And um, one night he calls him and asks him if he could come over and give him a blessing. When he is president of the church, he says, will you come over and give me a blessing? So that'd be kind of a, even if you're our best friends, you know, good friends with the prophet, I don't know, going over to give the prophet of the church a blessing would be kind of intimidating. So he said he went over and uh, Sister Hunter was there and she said, oh, I'm glad you're here, John. Thanks for coming. And he, she said he's in this uh, office. So she, he went into his little office there and they sat and talked for a minute and he said, well, uh, President, I can, you know, give you a blessing. Um, are you sick? And President Hunter said, no, no, I'm not sick. And uh, our, uh, his friend, John Huntsman said, well, why do you need a blessing? All right, you ready for this? Are you ready for this? Slow down the recording, my friends. I'm going to give you a second. I know you have me on 2.0 speed. Slow it down because you ready for this. Howard W. Hunter looked at his friend, John Huntsman Sr., and said, I need a blessing because today I had an unkind thought. And I just need a blessing. You guys, do you know how many blessings I'd need today? Ah, right? I, we all have a long ways to go on repentance. Can you see why Elder Anderson would say we must become converted? to daily repentance. All right, uh, so those are your two review slides. Make sure you know them really well. Uh, make sure that you're teaching them to other people. Make sure that you are uh, maybe creating your own questions based on the bullet points and you are going to do really well on the second exam. All right, put your notes away for now and get your scriptures out and let's just look at uh, let's just look straight at the scriptures. And again, I'll give you a review slide for all this. You know that you know the routine, so you don't have to be writing everything down and really uh, what's going on here. I will give you a review slide for all of it. But I just really want you to engage here. So try to put your you know put your phone away. If you are using your scriptures on your phone, put it on airplane mode or something so uh, you don't get um, distracted by a text. Because I totally would if I was looking reading my scriptures and a text came in from especially one I've been waiting for, right? Especially if it's someone who's going to ask me out, right? How exciting! Uh, so make sure that you um, you know put it on airplane mode so you can really focus in because that's where that's where. Uh, we're going to worship God with our mind here by learning. So we don't want to be distracted in any way. All right. Um, first, uh, in order to understand Luke chapter 9 and 10, we really need to understand the Samaritans. Now, I think I've done a little bit of this before, but let's go over it again. Um, and we can just use the Bible dictionary for this. Uh, you, you read this before, I think. Um, so the title of Samaritans is used to describe the people who inhabited Samaria after the captivity of the Northern Kingdom of Israel. So if you take a look at the map on the left, you can see, can I actually make markings on this? Um, you can see pen color, uh, blue, of course. You can see Jerusalem down here, right? You can see Galilee up here. So this is where, uh, Nazareth is. You see that right there? There's Nazareth. Um, and if Joseph and Mary are going to take the trip down to Jerusalem, they've either got to go 60 miles through Samaria, right? And they did a little U-turn there for a second. And, uh, or they're going to cross the Jordan River and come all the way down and cross it back and go into Jerusalem that way because they don't want to set foot in Samaria. That would be an extra nine, you know, an extra 30 miles or whatever they have to go. Okay, so uh, you can see where Samaria is. It's right between these two areas. So Jews live up here and Jews live down here and Samaritans live between. Uh, so this is kind of an interesting, uh, interesting, you know, um, cultural uh, issue here that you've got uh, your rival basically living between your two major areas. All right. Uh, now, how did this happen? How did they end up there? Uh, maybe you already know because we've talked about it, but let's go over it again. Uh, what happened in 722, 721 BC? 
did you get it right? The Northern Kingdom of Israel was destroyed by the Assyrian army and taken captive. And uh, either many were killed or many fled or, you know, uh, or many became Assyrians or some ended up staying and, you know, in the area and uh, kind of living around the Assyrian people. And then what happened in 587 or 586 BC? About 130 years later, just after Lehi left, the, Bab the Babylonians took over the southern kingdom of Judah. Did you get both of those right? I'm praying and hoping that you did get both of those right. All right. Now, when there's all these foreigners now living in uh, this entire area, so this would be the northern kingdom of Israel, this area up here, and this would be the southern kingdom of Judah, this area down here. All right. Um, now you've got Assyrians and Babylonians uh, still living here through the years, right? Through the decades, they have children who have grandchildren of grandchildren. And some of the Jews then intermix, and, you know, I think I talked about this with my daughter, Maddie, marrying Brad, the Babylonian soldier. And my grandchildren are now half Jewish, half Gentile, right? Well, when the Jews come back, uh, sorry, when... Um, when what happens in around five, did I get the, why can't I think of the year? 532, 533, did I get the year wrong on this? You guys, I should have reviewed this. Um, what happens? Uh, that is when King, of, King Cyrus of Persia, right? When he comes into, how do I use the eraser? How do I get rid of all this stuff now? Uh, there is no eraser, eraser. Oh, look, it's easy. Feels like I'm doing a football play. Well, this guy here is going to go down the field here, and then this guy is going to go. Sorry. Look at me just erasing. This is so fun. It's kind of hard sometimes. Sometimes it doesn't erase. It's like a real eraser. Okay. Um, so when Cyrus allows the Jews to rebuild their temple, let's read it straight out of here. The title is used to describe the people who inhabited Samaria after the captivity of the northern kingdom of Israel. Got it? Uh, they were the descendants of foreign colonists placed there by the kings of Assyria and Babylon. Israelites who escaped at the time of the captivity, the population was therefore partly Israelite and partly Gentile, half Jew, half Gentile. Their religion was also of a mixed character, though they claimed as to be worshipers of Jehovah to have a share in the rebuilding of the temple at Jerusalem, right? So when Cyrus allows the Jews to return to rebuild the temple, which is in Jerusalem, right? No, no, no. Let me click on the laser pointer. Okay, so here's the temple right down here. Oh, wait. That's a laser pointer. I don't want a laser pointer. I want a pen color. Blue, of course. All right, so here's the temple right down here in Jerusalem. Um, they are not allowed by Jews who think that they are kind of um, half-bloods, right? Uh, and they leave. They become bitter opponents of the Jews and start a rival temple up here in their own Mount Gerizim, right? And they start to claim that they are the true religion um, and that uh, they are the real Jews and that all of Jewish history took place here in Samaria, not down here. Um, Abraham didn't sacrifice Isaac here on Mount Moriah. He sacrificed him here. Well, he never sacrificed him, but you know what I mean, in Mount Ger uh, Gerizim. Uh, so hopefully this is all making sense. Uh, that They basically stole the religion and took it to the north. I I'm pretty sure we've talked about this. When Nehemiah ejected from Jerusalem a grandson of the high priest Elishab on account of his marriage with a heathen woman, that's a Gentile, he took refuge with the Samaritans, taking with him a copy of the five books of Moses, the Pentateuch, and according to Josephus, became high priest, right? So now they have a high priest up here, and there's a high priest down here. Uh, there are several references in the New Testament to the antagonism between the Jews and the Samaritans. All right. And uh, it says, but the people of Samaria were included among those to whom the apostles were directed to preach the gospel later in the book of Acts. But remember, in Matthew chapter 10, do not teach Jews. Do not 
teach Samaritans. All right. So, oh, let's not skip yet. Let's go to Luke chapter 9, verses 51 through 56. This is a great story that nobody ever tells. All right. In Luke chapter 9, the Savior is traveling from Galilee to Jerusalem. Do you think the Savior is going to go around Samaria, or do you think he's going to go through Samaria? He's going to go through Samaria. Why? Because Jesus loves to make people uncomfortable. So uh, in Luke chapter 9, it says, And it came to pass that when the time was come that he should, this is verse 51, uh, that he should be received up. He's heading to from uh, Galilee right up here. This is where he lives. See, um, Capernaum is right by the Sea of Galilee. See, Tiberias right by the Sea of Galilee. All right. And they're going to go down through Samaria to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered to a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. So he's got to stop in Samaria um, and stay the night. Now, this is not going to go over very well, you guys. <laughs> not for either group. There's no Samaritans that are going to be happy to see him. Well, I shouldn't say there's none. I'm sure there's some. Uh, but there's not a lot of, there's, I, I doubt there's going to be a lot of love between these, these two groups. So let's go to Samaria and uh, let's stay the night. They would not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem, which means they would not receive him because he was a Jew. <clears throat> and when his disciples, James and John, saw this, when they, they were upset, they said, Lord, should we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them as Elijah did? Whoa. Okay, that's your first option? You guys, this is James and John, Peter, James, and John. This is a, what we would say the first presidency. So this is Elder Oaks, President Oaks, and President Eyring, uh, who turn to Jesus and say, they don't say, should we teach them? Should we serve them? Should we feed them? Remember, this is a, toward the ends of his life. So, I mean, they've been with him a long time. They say, no, Lord, let's not feed them, serve them, or help them. Let's nuke them, right? Uh, let's blow them up. Now, um, this is... This is, wow, okay, uh, they, wanted to, they wanted to kill these people. But he turned and he rebuked them and he said, he does get mad, but he doesn't get mad at the Samaritans. He, get mad, he gets mad at them. You know not what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives. I didn't come here to kill people. I came to save them. Favorite sentence of the whole story. Look at verse 56. And they went to another village. All right, so let's talk here for a second. Um, I have a couple of apl application points, things I want you to think about. Uh, and maybe you can bring this up in the q and I hope, I hope one of you will. Um, uh, because I want to hear your answers. This is a, uh, it's a funny story, right? You know, and I, I hope you um, laughed at my dumb jokes. But let's be honest, this is pretty bad. Um, they want to kill people based on their race. Now, let me ask you a question. Should James and John be apostles? Should he kick them out of the 12? Should he say, you know what? I was wrong about you guys. You should know better than uh, about this by now. Are you answering those questions? That's what I hope you're doing right now. I hope you're not just staring at me. But I hope you're answering these questions. Should James and John still be apostles? Seeing that they have these really big prejudice, should he keep them around? Now, if someone were to ask me these questions, I think I might say something like, it is not my place to judge these men because they're not apostles of brother Smith. They are apostles of Jesus Christ. And if you're an apostle of Jesus Christ, I'm, I'm assuming the only person who gets to judge your apostleship is Jesus Christ. Second, I don't think when the Lord calls an apostle or a prophet or any other leader, he unmakes them a human being. So they still have to deal with uh, the culture they grew up in and the teachings of their parents. I think the Lord can use imperfect tools. Now, 
I'm not overly concerned with Peter, James, and John as much as I am with even if we go more recent in our own history. If you look in the history of the church, you'll, you might see statements from people that you say, that's bad. Like, that's a wrong thing to say, uh, whether it's racist or anything else. And maybe you could come back to this story in your mind saying, well, it's not my job to judge their apostleship. They're not my apostles. Uh, Brigham Young said that about Joseph Smith. He said, yes, I saw his flaws. Yes, I saw his errors. But it's not, he's, he's not my prophet. He's God's. It wasn't my place to judge him. Um, and then let's learn in our own lives uh, to look at our own selves and go, you know, how can I be too quick to judge or too quick to want to hurt someone? Right now, I don't think any of you are going to be like, Lord, nuke them. Uh, but we, you know, we can be really quick to uh, condemn, right? How many of you, and you can raise your hand here, even though I can't see you, how many of you have ever been too quick to judge a sibling? Right? You're like, Lord, get them. And maybe the, the Lord would say, I didn't come here to, to condemn your siblings. I didn't send you to condemn your siblings. I, I sent you there to save them. Right? And then that phrase, they went to another village. That doesn't mean you're going to go to a new family. I just mean that sometimes maybe uh, I picture James and John going, oh, we're just going to go somewhere else. Yeah. You, you don't want to. You don't want to blow them up? No. Okay. How about we just go somewhere else? And sometimes it's easier to, instead of blowing up, to just, you know, let it, let it roll off you a little bit. Some battles aren't worth fighting. Uh, I know this is maybe a dumb application, but when I'm driving and um, someone does something to upset me, cuts me off or something, I try to remember the Savior saying, it's fine. Let's just let them go. How about that? How about we just not worry about it? Right? I didn't come here to destroy people. I came to save them. So let's just go to another village. Like, let's just not worry too much about it. Anyway, uh, great story, right? And I took way too long on it, but it's a great story. Okay. That moves us exactly into our next story, which is going to be uh, the parable of the good Samaritan. Now, do you see how much the Jews hate the Samaritans? So uh, when we hear good Samaritan, we don't growl like, Ur. so you really need to hear the parable of the good enemy. That's really what this is. Uh, it'd be like the parable of the good anti-Mormon. You're like, no. Uh, the parable of the good Ute fan, right? Whatever it is that someone that you're like, no, the parable of the good Republican. No, the parable of the good Democrat, right? No, whatever it is, someone you're just like, no, they are not good people. And the Savior would introduce you this story. Um, it starts with a certain lawyer stood, standing up to tempt him, meaning he wants, to, he wants to make him look stupid. And he said, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? The Savior is really great here. He says, uh, <laughs> now a lawyer is professional law, right? What's the law? The law of Moses. So this guy reads the scriptures a lot. And he says, uh, do you read? What shall I do to inherit eternal life? Do you read? Right? You ask a lawyer if they know the law. Uh, what, is the, what do the scriptures say? And he answering, and I'm wondering if he's like sincere here or if he's like, oh, I know the law. Uh, it says, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. The Savior's like, Why'd you ask me this question? What shall I do to have eternal life? Do so you know the scriptures? Yeah. Love God, love your neighbor. Good. Thou hast answered right. Do that and you will live. But he, willing to justify himself, that's verse 29, willing to justify himself, said, Who is my neighbor? Now, this is the part you need to understand of verse 29. There's a backstory here. Uh, the Pharisees, remember how we talked about adding oral law to the to the law of Moses? They added a lot of lots of hedge laws. Well, some of these hedge laws, um, were created to actually not be hedge laws, but to get them out of uh, keeping the higher law, uh, of, you know, the thing that they knew they should be doing. And one of these was they had defined neighbor. When the Lord said, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, these Pharisees had said, okay, what does that exactly mean? And the definition of neighbor was basically believing Jew, someone who was a, you know, so it would be like you and I, if you said, uh, we're supposed to love our neighbor. And you said, Brother Smith, who's my neighbor, right? Who's that? What's the definition there? And I would say, it's a temple recommending holding member of the church. That's the only people you need to treat as neighbor. They're not that way. If they're not a temple recommending holy member of the church, you do not have to be kind to them because that's not the law, right? So when he says, justify myself, he's like, oh, so who is my neighbor? Meaning, 
are you going to publicly disagree with what's written in the law? Because if you side with, um, uh, with the people who are not, like you're siding with unbelieving Jews and Gentiles and Samaritans, Romans, right? Are you really saying that that's our neighbor? And I think everyone in this crowd is going to turn on you if you say that. So instead of saying, yes, our neighbor is everyone, Jesus says, can I tell you a story? And he said, a certain man went from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among thieves. Now that's a pretty, um, it's called the bloody way, which is a just, is there a part of town in your hometown that you don't go to at night by yourself? Uh, because the bloody way between Jerusalem and Jericho, it's about 25 miles. It's the same route people would have taken to go see John the Baptist out at the Jordan River. If you look at our map here, do you see, uh, let's see, where's my mouse? How come I can't see the mouse? Oh, there it is. Uh, so here's Jericho right here down by the, by the Dead Sea. How come my lady, uh, I'm having way too much fun with this pen. You guys are like, stop, stop with the pen. So there's Jericho, there's Jerusalem, right? The traditional place of John the Baptist baptizing Christ and others is around this area right here. So they're going to take this journey, which is about 25 miles down to Jericho. All right, now, um, it's a long ways down. Do you see that? Jerusalem is the city set on a hill. It's up here in the mountains. Jericho is down way low below sea level down by, uh, here's the Jordan River down here. Here's John the Baptist. Hello. All right. Uh, and here's Jericho right next to that. Still there. Uh, it has a decent mall. Okay. Now, so um, that's uh, not a place you go by yourself. It's not a place you're going to walk um, on your own, especially, you know, uh, at night because it's known as the bloody way. You're going to get mugged if you go that way by yourself. So as Jesus tells this story, they're probably all like, what? Why would he do that? He goes from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves. Shocking. That's what happens. Which stripped him of his raiment. Interestingly, they don't take his stuff, if he had any. They take his clothes. They strip him of his raiment. They take his clothes. So he must have Lululemon on or something. And uh, they uh, depart, leaving him half dead. They wounded him, so they beat him up, and departed, leaving him half dead. That always makes me laugh. Half dead. He's not dead yet. He will be by morning. No, I'm not dead. I'm happy. Verse 31. And by chance, there came a certain priest that way. So this guy just, there's, he just happened to be there. He's on his way over. Uh, he's on his way up to the temple, I assume. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Does that make sense? Now, why? Why does the priest pass by on the other side? It, this, the Savior never says, but you've got to think um, there's got to be a couple of reasons. I don't have time. Um, now, you guys, he knows he's supposed to help. The guy, they took his clothes. He does not know if he's a Jew or a Samaritan, right? He doesn't know who he is. You can often tell these people by their clothes, right? Is he rich or is he poor? Uh, but the guy's got no clothes. So it, he, he doesn't know. Maybe he's like, ah, oh, I just don't have the time. I, it's too much of a hassle, right? I'm on my way to the temple. I can't be serving. I've got to go, right? Whatever it is, uh, apparently he wants nothing to do it. He sees him, but he just gets over on the other side. Maybe he's scared. Maybe the, he thinks he'll get mugged too, right? If he, uh, if he sticks around there. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at that place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. So at least the Levite goes and looks at him. What's the difference between a Levite and a priest? Well, um, let's put it this way. Um, all priests were Levites, but not all Levites were priests. Does that make sense? So this guy's from the tribe of Levi, probably works in the temple, but not as a priest, uh, just works assisting the priests. And um, he came and looked on him. Now that's a fascinating idea, right? Came and looked on him. So he... He's like, maybe he goes over to see if he knows him or to see if he's a Jew, right? Uh, or uh, to see if maybe if he's still alive, right? If you're still alive, maybe I'll help you. I don't know. The Levite seems to want to do something, but I'm not sure. Verse 33, a certain Samaritan, everyone would have growled when they heard this story. Ugh, a certain Samaritan, a certain enemy. As he journeyed. Now, as you see that phrase in verse 33, as he journeyed, go back to verse 31 by chance. Now in the Greek, that by chance and that as he journeyed are opposites. So in our language, it would be, but a certain Samaritan who was there on purpose or for this purpose. So he's some sort of EMT, some sort of like, um, he's out there looking for people who have been hurt. Uh, as he journeyed, the opposite of by chance, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion and he went to him. 
bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine. So he's like giving him first aid, set him on his own beast, right? You got the camel back there in the picture, set him on his own beast, took him to an inn and took care of him. So he took him to an inn, wherever close, I would say Jerusalem or Jericho, right? Those are your two cities to choose from and took care of him. And on the morrow, so he stayed there all night with the guy because this is the morning. On the morning when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said, take care of him and whatever you spend more, when I come again, I will repay you. So he basically gives the guy his credit card and he says, hey, whatever you need to spend is totally on me. And that's the end of the story. Then he looks back at the lawyer and he says, so um, which one of these do you think was the good guy? Now, the guy wanted the savior to openly say, right? He wanted him, he wanted him to defy the law and say that they should be helping Samaritans and they should be helping Gentiles, uh, right? We should be serving, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, right? We should be loving Jews or Gentiles and Samaritans as much as we love believing Jews, our real neighbors, right? And Jesus, um, instead of just flat out, you know, telling that guy, yes, that's true. All people are your neighbor. He says, so who do you think is the good guy in the story? <laughs> he did, this is brilliant. This is absolutely brilliant because the guy had, what are you going to say? What are you going to say? The first guy, the second guy, the priest or the Levite, the believing Jew? No, you can't say that. You've got to say, he doesn't even say the name. This is funny. He says, um, uh, he said, he that showed mercy on him. He doesn't want to say Samaritan, apparently. He that showed mercy on him, right? And the Savior said, yeah, you're right. Be like that guy. Go and do that likewise. So um, as we initially look at this parable, there is a beautiful story here of who is your neighbor? Everyone. Who should you be inclined to serve? Everyone. And I would even say, especially those not like you, right? Can you think of someone who might be the exact opposite of you? You might think of a, if you're ultra conservative, you might think of a liberal, right? If you are um, uh, ultra liberal, you might think of a conservative, right? Whatever. Um, I'm trying to think of other opposites. You might think of someone who uh, has no interest in religion whatsoever, right? Uh, an anti-Mormon, uh, right? Whatever. Someone who is not like you, the Savior would say, that is your neighbor. Because if you treat them well, everyone else is going to fall into place. Notice the Samaritan does not care if the guy's a Jew or a Gentile, doesn't even see he, right? He doesn't know. So he serves him. Okay, now I want to talk to you about something else because uh, through the centuries, as p other people have looked at this story, uh, they've seen the Savior maybe telling another story here. Uh, now, I, it's an interpretation. It's not saying, oh, look, we found the Good Samaritan Da Vinci Code. Uh, but I do want you to see it because it's an important, I think it's an important interpretation. Uh, we talked about how Jerusalem is the highest city in the Holy Land and Jerusalem is, and Jericho is the lowest city in the Holy Land. Right, So the Savior told, chose the two extremes, Jerusalem and Jericho. So if you outline the parable here, what if, now just again, put your scriptures away, and, or you don't put them away, but just focus on the screen here for a minute. What if, yes, the Savior is telling a story about being a neighbor, but he's also telling a story about the fall of man. Let's say that our man represents Adam. And that his fall from Jerusalem to Jericho, from the, where the temple is to the furthest point away, is like Adam's fall. Adam and Eve, the fall, right? From somewhere heavenly to, to earth, right? Let's say then that if it's Adam and the fall, because by the way, um, he actually uses the word fell. A certain man went from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell. Fall, uh, fell among thieves. The, the thieves would be Satan, Right who take him his raiment, his clothes. Now, clothes in the ancient world is very much your identity. Notice in the Book of Mormon, the moment you get rich, what changes very first, right? They're costly apparel. It's your identity. Good thing we don't do that today. I am so happy we do not live in a world where your clothes can identify you as someone better than others. Can you imagine if we live somewhere like that? Um, we would say that the wounds then are the sins. Adam's come to come to earth and he has experienced spiritual death through sin, right? Notice that he leaves him, the thieves or Satan, leaves him half dead. 
he's experienced spiritual death through sin. He has not yet experienced physical death, right? Those of you uh, who have taught the gospel of Second Nephi 2 know that the fall brought two types of death into the world, right? Physical and spiritual death. Physical death from our bodies dying and spiritual death from sin. By chance, a certain priest came that way, and, and sort of the Levite. Let's say that the priest uh, represents the law of Moses or anything else that I think can save me, or the Levite represents a prophet, right? Can the law of Moses save Adam from the fall? No. Can prophets or priesthood or the temple save Adam from the fall? No. None of these things can save Adam from the fall, and yet they, these Pharisees believe that the law of Moses is how you gain salvation, right? That's the same question Abinadi asked the priests of King Noah. Do you think salvation comes from the law of Moses? And they said, yes. And he says, no, it doesn't. The law points us to someone, the Samaritan. Why would Christ use, if, he, if this interpretation is true, which I just, I love it. So I have a tendency to think the Savior was doing this on purpose. Why would he describe himself as a Samaritan? One, the Jews, the Pharisees hate Samaritans. Two, they're kind of a half Jew, half Gentile, and the Savior himself is a half mortal, half immortal person. Came where he was. Doesn't that sound Christ like Christ coming to earth? He had compassion on him. He went to him. He bound up his wounds. What did we say the wounds were? Sins. Binding them up. God could be a sense of covenants, right? Used oil and wine. Now, oil and wine are both used as symbols of the atonement. Set him on his own beast, right? Remember Isaiah saying, surely he has borne our griefs, took him to the inn. Now we would say that could represent the church. Where does the Savior bring those who are wounded by sin? He brings them to the church and says, take care of him. And when I come again, talking about the second coming, I will repay thee. So what's fascinating here is the Savior might be answering both questions. The man asked him, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And who is my neighbor? In our first interpretation, we said that the Savior was saying, your neighbor is anyone, right? So he answered the, the question, who is my neighbor? In, the, in this interpretation of the parable, he answered the next question, what do I do to inherit eternal life? Because as good as it is to be nice to your neighbor, it does not give you eternal life. The only way to eternal life is through the Savior, or in this interpretation, the Samaritan. If you have questions on this, let me know in the Q&A. Hopefully, I've explained it clearly enough to where you can, you can see the parallel uh, between the two. Um, uh, the, probably the first person to see this or to, to take this interpretation, again, there's no evidence in the scriptures that this is the interpretation that the Savior meant. I need to make that very clear uh, because some people might say, no, I don't, I don't think that that's true. And you want to be like, you're a non-believer. No, right? I have, there's religion professors at BYU who are like, mm, I, I think it's just, you know, it's a good interpretation. It's a nice interpretation, but it's not what the Savior intended. Uh, they would see it as eisegesis, right, instead of exegesis. just depends on your, um, your point of view. All right, uh, so let me know if you have any questions on that. All right, let's go to Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. This is a, a scripture verse that's often uh, not talked about in Elder's Quorum, but is uh, sometimes referred to in Relief Society because it's the story of Mary and Martha. Um, you've got the Savior teaching this family, Mary and Martha, uh, and they have a brother named Lazarus. This is the same Lazarus as the Savior is going to rise from the dead uh, in John chapter 11. So they're a family. They're siblings, and they live together, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And it seems that whenever the Savior goes to Jerusalem, he stays with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. They live in a town called Bethany. And Bethany, let me see if I can go back to our map. Bethany would be right about here. Do you see where I'm putting this little V right here? That would be where Bethany is. It's, a, it's four or five miles from Jerusalem. Uh, kind of, you know, just uh, that's what they're going to hike down to Jerusalem uh, or over to Jerusalem every day. Uh, and then at the end of the day, instead of staying in Jerusalem, the Savior is going to walk back to Bethany. So it seemed that a lot of the teachings, like the cursing of the fig tree, that happens on the walk between the two, uh, between Bethany and Jerusalem. Does that make sense? We'll talk about that more later. But uh, he's staying with these, this family, and um, it says that Mary was just sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to him, and Martha was cumbered about much serving. It means she's busy. Cumbered and busy are basically the same word. Martha was busy with serving and, uh, and came to him and said, Lord, 
So that's Martha there pouring the water, right? Or whatever she's pouring back there. She says, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me. Um, so you've got Mary sitting and listening to Jesus. You've got Martha who um, is, I guess, cooking food and serving people, getting basins ready for people to wash their feet, uh, you know, getting beds ready. If he's got his apostles with him, it's probably a big crew that he brings with him. Um, so uh, let's look at the Savior's response. Jesus answered and said, Martha, Martha, thou art careful. Careful in this verse, look at the footnote, worried. Thou art worried and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful. So basically it's the idea of one thing is vital, crucial, and Mary hath chosen that part, that good part. Which, hath not, which shall not be taken away from her, meaning uh, she's getting something permanent here. Uh, now, what would you say, this is maybe an eisegetical look at this because I'm not sure Luke intended us to learn anything from this story. He doesn't say he does, but let's just say he did. Let's say Luke intended for us to learn a lesson. What do you think it is? Talk out loud. I know you're, you're, it's weird to talk to your computer. You're by yourself, but talk out loud. What do you think it is? If someone were to ask me, if they were to say, Brother Smith, what's the point of this story? I would, I would think one, you could do a lot of things with this. You could say um, kind of a good, better, best idea that there's good ideas in life. There's good things to do. There's better things to do. And there's best things to do. I've noticed as I've gotten older, I don't really do a lot of choosing between good and bad. Like that's not, my day isn't usually like, that's good, that's bad. Which one should I choose? My day, and I bet yours is too, is a lot of which one's good, which one's better, and which one's best. Do I spend time with my kids or do I go to the temple? It's not good or bad. That's good, better, best, right? And it depends on, you know, the day or the relationship or whatever's happening. I've got to make those decisions, um, right? Should I help my wife clean up or should I go read to my kids? right? Those are interesting choices where it seems like the Savior is saying, you are making a good choice or even a better choice. But Mary has made the best choice here in this situation. Well, why? Well, how often are you going to have the Savior of the world there teaching you, right? How often are you going to have dirty dishes? How often are you going to have uh, beds to make? And, you know, and, and if she's struggling with food, he's pretty good with that right? She could go to him and say, Lord, I want to sit and listen to you. Um, but what's going to happen here? And he might say, oh, I can take care of that for you. Uh, he might be, and if you look at the story, he might be totally fine with what Martha is doing uh, and versus what Mary is doing. They both serve differently, right? They serve him differently. And he might be saying, don't judge the way other people choose to worship me or obey me or serve me. And I think that's a good lesson in life, right? Don't, don't, don't judge how other people choose to serve. Um, cause sometimes we do that, right? Like we have our way of serving. Maybe I keep my shirt and tie on until midnight on Sunday, right? Cause I want to obey the Sabbath. And then when I see my roommate doesn't, good thing I'm making the better choice, right? Lord, you should tell him to be as good as me. Or the Lord might be saying, no, that's just not how he chooses to serve me, right? I might never do my homework on Sunday, uh, but someone else might. Um, and am I, am I, can I look at them and say, Lord, tell them to be like me. So there, there's, a, there's, some good, there's some good things to learn here. And notice he doesn't really get mean to Martha. He says, you're very worried and very busy right? Like it's not like she's making a bad choice here. Um, now, one other question that I thought of would be Martha's, in Martha's head, perhaps she thinks, perhaps she thinks she has a lot to offer Jesus, right? Lots of serving to offer Jesus. But who offers more? Does, is it, does Martha offer Jesus more or does Jesus have more to offer to Martha? in terms of teaching her. So sometimes we want to 
give to the Lord, right? Lord, I'm going to give, give, give. When the Lord says, that's good. Thank you for giving me and serving me. How about you listen to me now and just do some taking from me? Because I have more to offer you than you have to offer me. All right. Um, let's take a break right there. Let's make that our first half. Um, and hopefully that wasn't too long. I have no idea how long it was um, because I haven't been watching the clock. So come back for part two of our lecture seven. All right. See you in a second.